Workloads protected by VMware are the safest workloads in the multi-cloud. Private cloud, public cloud, any cloud. Stronger, with distributed protection to the API and everything east-west, inside and cross-cloud. Stronger, with three layers of detection, trusting nothing and seeing everything, even the best hidden bad actors. Stronger, with an SE Labs AAA certified advanced NDR that brings the multi-cloud together for the win. You've got workloads, we've got security. VMware security, simply stronger. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash VMware to learn more. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to any of our podcast feeds. Have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. We had an absolute blast putting together this year's Security Weekly Unlocked virtual event. All presentations are now available on demand for your viewing pleasure. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash unlock to register and watch now. We also have uh, some upcoming webcasts uh, that you might have seen that we're branding Security Weekly Unlocked also. Uh, very excited about those. Uh, the first one is going to be, this actually isn't in the announcements, but uh, we're, we're doing a whole episode on building different kinds of security labs. Uh, so that that should be a fun one. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> you had it on hand. Very nice. I might be getting ahead of myself there, but I'm. If you couldn't tell, I'm very excited about that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash esw255 uh, to look at all the uh, click the links and look at all the the news that we're going to go over today. And I think we'll get probably the, we don't have a ton of stuff today, but uh, we've got some pretty interesting ones. Um, I think first, you know, Tyler, I didn't see this. We've been talking about what to call, what to rebrand unicorns as, or, mm. or how to deal with the unicorn problem that there's there's almost a thousand unicorns now, uh, globally. And, um, yeah, apparently somebody somebody coined them dragons uh, or the replacement for unicorns. So he's pitching dragons, uh, and they have to be at least twelve billion uh, oh. for for the valuation oh. to be that's, called a that's, dragon. That's astronomical. That's a huge number. Yeah, and you know, I think anybody trying to replace unicorns, you know, the way they're picking that number is they're they're looking for it to be fairly rare. You know, so they're just looking at, okay, how many are left if I put the number here? Okay, how many are left if I put the number here? So at 12, I think it's something like three, no, it's 19. If you, if you make it 12 billion, and this is as of August, it's probably changed now. There's probably 100 dragons. <laughs> and and but, that's uh, 19 That's nineteen for cybersecurity specific dragons or for generalized no, no, tech, tech everything. dragons? Okay. Yeah, the U.S. Dragons would be, and, and this is back in August. I totally missed this, um, but I'm bringing it up now because we've talked about this so much. Um, but at the time, uh, in August, the U.S. Dragons were Stripe, SpaceX, Instacart, Epic Games, Databricks, Rivian, Chime, Fanatics, and Plaid. So no Cyber Dragons. <laughs> No cyber dragons, and I actually put together a, a spreadsheet. Uh, I don't have it open at the moment, but I don't think any cybersecurity companies reached that 12 billion mark. Uh, I think uh, the the largest is just shy. Was it Snick? Sneak? Sneak or Snick is up there for sure. I'm, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to load the same sheet because you shared you shared that sheet with me earlier today. So I have it open in one of my 3,700 Google tabs. Yeah, I've I've been sharing a lot of a lot of sheet and uh, a lot of a lot of sheet. Is that was that an intentional pun? <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was an intentionally unfortunate pun. No, Tanium. <laughs> Tanium is the largest at nine wow. billion, and SNCC is eight point six. Lacework oh. all also up there at uh, eight point three. Wiz Netscape should be up there. Two point seven. Yeah, Wiz is six. So yeah. Wiz is number five on that list. Who is going to be the first world's first cyber dragon? Cyber dragon. <laughs> mm. uh, and I like I, that I term. It's, 
I like that term a lot. It's specific to our market. It and I, we can set the limit at twelve billion exactly like you know the article said. I, I think yeah, it, it works. makes sense to uh, to take bets on what's going to be the first cyber dragon. Um, and and my, my, my take bets on okay. when that's going to happen. I will set the over under date to be June of next year. To be June of next year, and I will also even set uh, odds if someone's willing to DM me and take them. Um, I will set or figure out a way to set some odds that it's going to be in the cloud security space by June of next year. Okay, by June of next year, uh, I think it's going to happen. Dragon. I think we'll see our first dragon in Q1 of next next year. Personally, whoa! So uh, you're taking the under. You're taking the under all day. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm 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 betting on Q1, and um, as far as the category goes. I mean that's that's Absolutely. a pretty safe one. Cloud, cloud cloud security is is a pretty safe one, but um, oh Could Snick man. get there? AppSec. AppSec. Gosh, I mean Let's I see. can't tell you. So I've been in AppSec for half my career, and everybody's always used to say AppSec is a niche niche market inside of a niche market. Meaning AppSec inside of security is so small, it'll never it'll never be a monster. And now we've got in consideration for the the world's first cyber unicorn as an AppSec player. Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it's going to be some kind of detection and response company, like like a, like an XDR vendor. Ooh, got any names on that list? Since you do have the uh, the dragon list in front of you. Yeah, well, I've got the unicorn list uh, in in front of me, and I think there's a good chance it's going to be somebody already on this list. That's uh, kind of a, like a lower unicorn. You know, when they raise one of their next rounds, they, they could be up there. Run, um, run down the top the top handful again. Yeah, honestly, I, it it could be uh, a services uh, XDR firm like Ar- Arctic Wolf is right at number seven on that list. Mm, I forgot about them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Arctic Wolf Networks is is right there, but yeah, starting from the top. Um, actually, there there are five that are over five billion in valuation, and it's Tanium, Snick, Sneak, Lacework, Netscope, and Wiz. So you got two of them. Lacework and and Wiz are both cloud sec. Sneak or Snick yeah, is app sec. Netscope is sassy. You used to be yep. Casby. Tanium, mm-hmm. Tanium endpoint slash probably trying to be XDR. Yeah, they haven't gone that route yet. So that would be that would be an interesting move for them because uh, I'm not sure that they've got that strong in EDR play. Uh, to be uh, honest, you know. All right, they, here's, what of, Here, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do, Adrian. I'm going to take your yeah. list. I'm going to publish it on Twitter, and I'm going to do a Twitter poll. And we'll see how many people vote uh, on the next cyber or the first world cyber, the world's first cyber dragon. And we'll let the crowd source it. We'll let the crowd decide. Number eight on that list is an interesting one. Coalition is a cyber insurance firm that also has products uh, that they they basically push Mm -hmm. on their policyholders. Uh, Well, not even push. Like, I, I think that's part of the holding the policies. You've got to use their stuff. That they actively monitor. All right. Well, it's going to be interesting to see where those cyber dragons come come into play. Um, I can't wait to ask the world. Yeah, yeah, it should be interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for your tweet and uh, make sure to share that. Awesome. Pull that up here. All right. Um, let's see, where were we? Yeah. So, dragons, uh, twelve billion. Looking for our first there. Um, an interesting funding. We don't have a ton of funding, you know, I assume, because it's, uh, you know, December. You know, it's not not really a good, good time to make those kinds of announcements. But we do have a few uh, funding announcements here. Uh, we've got Corellium, which, if memory serves, wasn't that the company that Apple sued because they basically facilitated people finding bugs in, in iOS? You know, they... You you could, yep. You know, basically basically run VMs with uh, you know iOS images with you know virtual iPhones, so you could uh, fuzz and test uh, that, yep, that, yep. that attack surface, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't remember the specifics of a lawsuit. I believe you. You're probably right, because that's absolutely what they've built and what they've created is kind of a hypervisor module for purpose built um, testing of systems, right? Rapid hardware prototyping, security testing, et cetera, over the top of whatever underlying operating system you need, including ARM based uh, systems in particular. It's interesting. So they raised an A round. I don't know how they were funded before this because they've been around for a couple of years. I think they've been around since at least 2017. And uh, and the press release doesn't even mention Apple, but I believe that was only a couple of months ago. It was earlier this year that uh, that I think they, they won that lawsuit or it was settled uh, at a court. I forget exactly how it how it wrapped up. But um, but yeah, very, very interesting company, and and I'm glad they won it because there aren't a whole lot of organizations that do this. If you want virtual Android devices, you know, dozens of companies that you can choose from, uh, including AWS. I, I think AWS does that as well, where you can just spin up uh, vir- virtual Android devices for testing, and um, much tougher to do with with Apple stuff. You know, in fact, uh, you see in a lot of data centers, like like there'll be just like a Mac Mini sitting there in the data center because they, you know, they need the Mac Mini to be able to build uh, whatever app uh, the company publishes. And there's there's just not a smooth way to do that in the cloud or anything like that. So Apple yep. tends to be this kind of weird one off because uh, a, a lot of things still depend on their hardware. Yeah. Yeah. I remember working at a um, an AppSec company a while back that uh, put together racks of physical um, Apple devices. And we were using them for, we would hook them up and runtime debug them in real time and basically to run applications, to exercise them, to do all sorts of things for security testing of individual apps on devices. And there just was no good, exactly what Carillion brings to the table, the ability to have like a, you know, 100 VMs of Apple running on different revs of Apple versions, uh, operating system versions, et cetera. Um, we actually had racks and racks of of Apple phones and iPod minis and yeah. iPod, you know, whatevers and and tablets and all with different versions so that we could run all these apps and test them looking for security bugs. Yeah, yeah. Kind of an awkward, uh, awkward place to do it, you know, because they defend that so much, you know, on the on the plus mm-hmm. side, you know, their their hardware is 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 pretty tight. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a reason that iOS bugs are worth you know, well mm-hmm. over a million dollars. I, I'm not sure what they're priced at now, but uh, but yeah, also inconvenient for any, anybody mm-hmm. trying to do any kind of testing or uh, app production at scale. Absolutely. It's a lot easier on the Android stack side for sure. Yeah. And then in the uh, uh, on the market side of things, uh, the other really interesting thing here was ZeroFox, uh, you know, talks that uh, they're going to go public uh, via SPAC. Wow. <laughs> With an expected equity value of $1.4 billion. Wow. Okay. First of all, there's a handful of things here that give me pause. And I, I you know, I, I don't like talking bad or talking about a company's percentage chance of something when I haven't done a deep dive with the executive team and I haven't done, you know, a deep dive on the product in a couple of years. Um, so please take this with a grain of salt. But $1.4 billion is such a very small valuation to be doing this. And to do this in a situation where the SPAC market has already collapsed public, publicly wise, um, the biggest SPACs of last year are all down 30 to 70% from their, top, from their highs. This feels to me like it is doomed for failure. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a, you know, analyst in this space per se with regards to the publicly traded markets and how these things work. So um, maybe it'll pull off because it is smaller. I don't know, but it just, it seems like a scary proposition to me right now, given current market states. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've got to agree, you know, zero Fox is um, it's not a big market. You know, they're, they're kind of unique in that market, you know, focusing on on the social side of things, you know, and digital risk management, you know, I think is kind of roughly the the market I would put them in. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you know, we, we've seen some, some, uh, some challenges, you know, going to market via SPAC, you know, I think complex earlier this year is an example of that where they, they tried to go public via SPAC and uh, ended up uh, pulling out of that. I think shortly after, after going public. 
Yeah. So like, uh, like any good, um, you know, market analyst, let's go ahead and circle back to the state of this thing at the end of Q1. If I'm right, we'll bring it up on another episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. If I'm wrong, we won't bring it up at all and pretend it never happened. <laughs> that works for me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Z Fox uh, is going to be their their ticker. Should be should be interesting. Uh, let's see. So. Uh, Really interesting report uh, popped up in in one of the slacks that I'm I'm in, and uh, this has been so contentious. Uh, so phishing training or security awareness training, whatever you want to call it, it it's a, a huge market. You know, no but no before went uh, public earlier this year. Uh, we've seen tons of acquisitions in in this. You know, this is uh, kind of a key piece of a lot of companies. Uh, cybersecurity portfolios is having some kind of security awareness training. And uh, yeah, basically this report uh, called Fishing in Organizations, Findings from a Large-Scale and Long-Term Study. Uh, I think it covered uh, well over 10,000 people uh, and, and the study went for 15 months. And basically the conclusion was, you know, security awareness training uh, is not nearly as effective as other studies in the past uh, and, and like half of this paper is is you know talking about the the previous studies and and why they were flawed yeah but basically they said it's it's not effective and in fact can have negative side effects yeah i didn't um you know when i when i saw this paper come across the wire i had flashbacks to my uh, master's degree time and decided not to actually spend the time reading it because it's long and it seems very academic and pedantic, which is fine. That's what it's meant to be. Um, but I'm not surprised that, you know, here's the thing. Anti-phishing training, security awareness training in general, it's a scenario where all you have to do is have one person fail to lose the game, right? Yeah. And it's an impossible scenario to secure. Yes, and and maybe I'm wrong at saying this. I haven't read the paper. Um, but yes, you can increase your security efficacy, right? You can maybe get a certain percentage of people to not fall for it. But at the end of the day, all it takes is one and your toast, right? And so, um, you know, I think how you define winning the game of security training or winning the game of anti-phishing, how you define that answer determines truly what your what your success rate will be and whether it's even worth doing these types of things, right? If you say, hey, we're good if we can cut cut down our risk exposure by 50% or 30% or 70% or whatever the paper says the efficacy rate is, we're good. If we can do that, we're happy. That's that much better. Then go ahead and do it. But if you set the the security or the end game of we won't fall for phishing and we won't get compromised by phishing, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And, you know, one of my big issues here is that with turnover, there's always somebody who hasn't gone through the training That's right. and different companies do the training in different ways. You know, we've seen a lot of negative uh, unintended side effects. Like I, I think it was the Chicago Tr Tribune that pulled everybody's bonuses for the year. And then somebody used the, hey, you're going to get a bonus phishing template on them shortly after that. And I hope that person was fired. Because that's just that's so. just wrong, <laughs> and you know we we we've seen that we've seen and there's so many factors involved here. Mm -hmm. You know I remember back in the day when I was working uh, as a pen tester for a, a consulting firm. You know we actually did quarterly uh, phishing training uh, for a small uh, small ish credit union. I think they had 15 to 20 branches in in uh, New England, and. You know, they got to the point Well, like 90 percent of the employees were, uh, you know, working at bank branches. You know, they, they were bank tellers and their the scope of their job is pretty narrow. You know, and, and in that case, you know, they got really good at, at spotting phishing and, and avoiding that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and it wasn't just email phishing we were doing. We were doing pretexting, you know, all, all kinds of different things. Uh, and. and I just don't think it works as well for like a general office worker who's, you know, 10%, 20%, 50% of their job is answering emails and, and replying to emails. And some of the un unintended effects we're seeing here is they're, they're over-reporting things, you know. And I think you do 
it is important to train employees on um, spotting stuff and having a mechanism for them to report it. I think that's important. But beyond that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And, and I think in recent years, one of the things that really kind of turned me off on a lot of this stuff is I started seeing companies that would write up employees that clicked on, on uh, phishing emails, you know, and if they did that, if that happened too many times, they get fired, you know, and people's, people's pay even being ducked, you know, like, like time off without pay yeah. if they clicked a, a phishing email, you know, so all, all of a sudden using it as this kind of punitive measure against employees uh, you know, for something that should have nothing to do with their job performance and has nothing to do with, you know, what, what they were hired to do there. Yeah, I think that the stick side of the carrot and the stick problem that you're describing is not a popular way of executing exactly for the reasons that you're talking about, right? It's just not related to it. And, you know, it's just that it's such a difficult scenario. You would literally, you'd probably hurt uh, you know, such a meaningful uh, uh, percentage of your employee base that it's almost it's almost impossible to go with the negative reinforcement model. It has to be positive reinforcement. It has to be frequent training. It has to be continuous training. And then where do you draw the line between that and wasting time, right? And not getting work done because when you're doing these fishing trainings, you're supposed to be doing something else to be building the business, right? So it's such a balance um, against risk and. I think the reality here is let's never expect perfection because it's impossible to achieve. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of my final thought on it is, um, you know, this shouldn't distract from the stuff that gets through. I mean, you've got to have some kind of plan, some kind of mitigation. Uh, you, you have to plan on somebody clicking things, you know, that, that are going to do malicious stuff. You know, it, it's, it, that that's another kind of trend that always annoyed me. The don't click stuff like people made stickers and all kinds of things like that. Um, <laughs> which is, it's just ridiculous. It's just, uh, you know, almost a statement that, Hey, this is hard and we've given up. So we're, we're just gonna, uh, you know, the easy way out is just to blame the average user for everything that goes bad in security. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I haven't read the whole thing. Uh, might uh, bring it back up again on another episode after I have time to to go through the whole paper. Uh, but it, it looks pretty comprehensive and uh, uh, somewhat damning. So it, it, it's going to be interesting to see the rest of the industry's response to this report. Uh, because, you know, I, I think one of the more effective attacks against this is going to be yeah, hey, in, in certain scenarios, you know, with certain factors, you know, it can be helpful, you know, it can be useful or, you know, those guys that are using it uh, that way, they're doing it wrong. We, we actually do it correctly over here. So I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot of a lot of stuff like that come out. Oh, yeah, there'll be a lot of a lot of finger pointing, a lot of uh, name calling. Uh, it should be drama on a platter. No, that, that paper is about the bad fishing. Anti-fishing technology. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've got the good stuff. <laughs> we have next gen. We have next gen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, interesting story here. Log4j, which we're not going to talk about much today. Just uh, kind of a side effect of that. Gray noise, uh, which is a really interesting threat intel company. It basically helps you weed noise out of your environment. Uh, they categorize and give you information on different noisy IPs on the internet. So th there are probably hundreds of companies now that do internet-wide scanning, Shodan, Census, um, you know, BitSight, even you know, some of these security scorecard companies do these full internet scans. And you can easily categorize that stuff, pull it out of your, your logs, use uh, uh, gray noise to, to filter that kind of stuff out. Yeah, And I, they I, may... I, Go ahead. I love I love gray noise. Andrew Morris, their CEO. I go I go back a few years with him. They're mm -hmm. just doing it. They flip the model on its head. Instead of saying we are going to put a bunch of sensors out on the internet and look for it, look for attacks and tell you what's important to you. What they're doing is they've got sensors all around the world, all over the internet, looking for the noise, the scanning, the junk that nobody cares about. And then they bring that into your environment and they allow you to filter and clean all of that garbage and junk out of your logs 
leaving you presumably with real attacks and real data that you can then act upon. Um, you follow <laughs> Andrew uh, Morris on Twitter and follow Gray Noise on Twitter. Andrew is just this snarky, fun dude, and I love his Twitter feed too. I highly recommend taking a peek at it. Yeah, it, it's uh, sorry. I was just laughing because uh, it just occurred to me that they they do network garbage collection. It's kind of yeah, <laughs> sounds about right. Up. Yeah, and that sounds like a snarky kind of comment that Andrew would make on his feed. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and his, his tweets are a lot of fun, and and just as likely to be insightful. There's some oh, interesting rabbit holes sure. he goes down identifying, you know, that there's some of this noise. Uh, that, yeah, he's, that he one of the, he's one of the brightest young entrepreneurs that I've met in a while uh, to the point where I wanted to invest in his company early on um, just because of how how smart that guy is. He's just really, really on point. I uh, highly recommend looking into at least the Twitter feeds, if not Gray Noise directly. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, Jonathan Crane a little bit, you know, like started this whole thing just by himself, just bootstrapped, you know, and and then, you know, when he was ready, uh, raised a modest amount of money. And uh, at this point, J. Crane has actually, uh, uh, you know, his company uh, got acquired and be interesting to see what what Gray Noise does from here. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, I was trying to use, I'm trying to remember what I was trying to use gray noise for. Uh, so, yeah, we, we were discussing, I uh, was discussing with someone uh, how many of these organizations do these full internet scans, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like Shodan, because they actually had Shodan, the, the founder and creator of Shodan on Paul Security Weekly last night. And so I was in the, the Discord having this discussion and we we're talking about how many uh, you know, how many actors there are that do full internet scans. And uh, I couldn't get the number from Gray Noise because AWS had its third outage of the month and Gray <laughs> Noise was impacted. Oh, geez. Um, but the answer ends up, uh, it's o over 10,000. Over 10,000. Wow. And, and some of those might be the same actors, like Shodan's got sensors all over the internet, you know, that, that do these internet-wide scans. And I'm sure other companies that do similar stuff uh, also do that. but. Yeah, over ten thousand yeah. sources are actively scanning the whole internet. But but back to the AWS suffering a third outage of the month. What the hell, AWS? You know how much of the world runs on the back of your stuff? You and gotta it was get east better. Again. It was, you gotta it was US, get better. US man, that's east unacceptable. Again. Yeah, that's just completely unacceptable. When you are the infrastructure system, outages are not allowed. And what's going to happen if AWS has more outages like this? People are going to learn to, or they should have already been, distributing their workloads on multi-sources for, you know, fallback and fail-safe and all of those kinds of things so that they wouldn't break if one of their infrastructure providers went down. If AWS wants to remain the de facto, if you're going to build it, build it on AWS East or AWS West, whatever you're closest to kind of situation, they got to fix their stuff. That's This is not going to work. Too much of the internet breaks when AWS suffers. Yeah. And uh, over at Azure, I'm not sure if it's much better. I mean, they, they've had a, <laughs> a, a really rough year uh, with security vulnerabilities, security issues, yep. you know, stuff just yep. like basic, you know, S3 bucket open type issues, you know, where, where, you know, data that should be private, you know, is accessible to either other Azure users or just to the public Internet. And I, I think we've seen at least a dozen stories related to that this year. And in fact, I think somebody from Amazon, uh, forget his name, Charlie something, uh, went over to Azure to try and, uh, you know, the general feeling is he was going over there to, to try and address some of these security issues that they've got over at Azure. Well, that's fine as long as he doesn't bring the outage issues with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah diff different roles, I'm thinking. Um, yeah, well. Both need to be fixed. And actually, there was another one in Amazon uh, in the last day or two, and I don't remember the details, but something about uh, Amazon employees having the ability to reach into um, customer data and data buckets, which was another big, ugly vulnerability for AWS uh, in the last 48 hours. So these things are popping up everywhere. And, you know, if we think back to the early days of the Internet as an infrastructure, right, like you had 
you had multiple infrastructure providers. We would pull multiple um, internet connections to our environments to make sure things didn't go down. We built our infrastructure on top of redundant internet connections, right? And if we've now abstracted that infrastructure up into that layer that Amazon now covers, it feels like we have to have a similar scenario, whether it's provided by Amazon directly, properly, the way they should be doing it, or choosing choosing from multiple vendors. Um, we really have to start as businesses focusing on our own reliability because we can't rely on the underlying infrastructure to be there when we need it. And it, it, it's going to be a tough lift because, um, you know, I, I don't think the average startup uh, or, or company that's moved to the cloud can handle doing multi-cloud. You know, there, there's just a lot more overhead and complexity there. You know, I, I suppose there's, you know, a market for companies that w- will build the overlay that makes multi-cloud yep. easier. Um, yep. You know, but certainly, you know, we need a solution and it would be it would be odd for it to not come directly from the Azure's in, in the AWS's. You know, it's uh, you, you would hope so. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and, you know, people may be pointing out that, uh, you know, you're supposed to go multi-region anyway. You know, Amazon's own stuff has been going down just as much as everybody else's. So I'm not I'm not sure I buy that. You know, I don't think Audible uh, would have gone down or, you know, the, the ability to submit trouble tickets to to AWS. Um you know, if it were as simple as, oh, you know, you're just supposed to build multi-region. Well, well I think what's really going to happen here is, and I don't want to get on too long of a rant here, but, you know, as we move applications, as enterprises move applications into the cloud, they've lifted and shifted, shove them in the cloud as one app. Then over time, we're now breaking those apps into microservices and different features running in their own little app containers in isolated units, right? It's the rise of microservices. What's going to happen is instead of running your microservices um, all in one thing, you'll distribute your microservice load across multiple vendors, or there will be some kind of abstraction layer that lets the the back-end vendor become irrelevant, and you code to some kind of no-code layer that is then run in multiple instances for you. Um, That's the only way you can possibly get to a multi-cloud, multi-vendor scenario that really is going to work cleanly without having significant overhead for the developer team. So I think there has to be some kind of abstracted layer for this to properly set up. Or Amazon's just got to fix it. They just got to learn how to fix it properly and not go down. Uh, because if they keep going down, people are going to find ways to distribute. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, Amazon is so deep and has such a culture around, you know, surfacing those kinds of problems and, and fixing them uh, that, that it's, it's, it's kind of shocking to see three in one month uh, hit them. So yeah, ho- hopefully that's um, you know they they kind of figure out a common source. You know maybe it's all coincidence. I don't know, but you know we're talking about a company that lays its own uh, trans oceanic uh, uh, <laughs> fiber. And, you know bought a company to do that. You know they build their own hardware. You know to to make make sure things go down less, you know, that, that there's less, uh, that can go wrong. They, they run custom firmware in their, on their diesel backup generators. Like if, if AWS can't do it, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how this works out. So talking about other problems that have been around for a long time that are really hard to overcome. Uh, there's now another super easy way to take over, uh, in, in AD domain and become domain admin, create your own domain admin. <laughs> it's a combination oh, of uh, two different CVEs. And I, I mean, there's probably plenty of AD infrastructure out there that this is going to be a, a forever zero day for. So pen testers are going to be, you know, five years from now are going to be creating domain admin uh, with, with this technique. Yeah, you know, so, um, <laughs> it's interesting. I used to use Log4j as my um, example. I used to say, could you imagine if somebody could pop Log4j? It's used in everything. And then those things oh, really? are used in everything, right? And now it came true. The other thing I always used to say is, man, AD is, if you pop AD, you get everything. That should be the target of every attacker. There you go. Here it is. It is. So I got to stop. I got to stop coming up with doomsday, doomsday scenarios. They came to, They appear to come true. Uh, e- either that or, or you need to tell more people about them. 
Oh, nobody listens to me. <laughs> that, I'm just a po- I'm just a shirt. podcast co-host. I'm just a podcast co-host. Nobody actually listens to me. Uh, and, and they they just made it so easy. Like like the the tools are already out there. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, you know, th- this one's a slam dunk. You know, for you know extortionists, you know criminals, pen testers, mm-hmm. and it's um, you know again brings up the question: how how long you know is Active Directory worth it? You know, are, are there any clear paths off of Active Directory? You know, it just well, seems like uh, yeah, Jump Cloud. I don't know. I mean, that's Octa well, that's the point. Let's, let's say you bail. Let's say you bail off AD and you go to Octa, you go to Jump Cloud, you go wherever you need to go. Uh, here's the thing, man. It's still a single juicy point of failure. If you can pop Octa, you know, and pop everybody's Octa instance, think of what you get access to. If you can pop a Jump Cloud, you know, for whatever, whatever zero date, same, same, you know, same theory exists. I call it the um, voice amplification. As an attacker, yeah. you're always looking for voice amplification. Hack one, compromise everywhere scenarios. Those are the things that cause, you know, forest fires of problems for the world that you can take advantage of. A perfect scenario is the transitive trust in software, i.e. log4j, right? How it transitively goes from one package to another because you embed it in things that are embedded in things that get used in things, right? Um, and so pop it once early in the food chain, smash everything all the way up the chain. AD is the same problem, right? And it just it doesn't matter where it lives, whether it's, you know, in Active Directory or Okta or Jump Cloud. It's, a, it's a, just a dangerous scenario. So those vendors have to spend significant time making sure that they secure those environments. That's that's really what it comes down to. Well, and I think one of the reasons that it's it's so... You know, damaging is because Active Directory is is so tied into Windows. You know, and Windows is a yep. well understood attack surface. You know, there's plenty of malware and, and tools to hack it. Uh, you know, the 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 knowledge is is broad about how to hack it. Um, you know, and an Active Directory does so much more than just a, a jump cloud or an Okta. Like it, it, it's tied into so many pieces of it, uh, and, and tends to you know, also be on flat networks, you know, of older companies that have lots of tech debt, you know, so you kind of add all that together, you know, and, and that's part of why Active Directory is is that perfect place to uh, to point your attacks at. Yep. And the, uh, other, the other thing I will say about this, too, is imagine if you, you um, anybody, any company and enter, any enterprise, and I think there's a number of them that have targeted this rightfully so as a business. Any enterprise or company that owns your identity, physically owns your identity, if that company gets popped, the voice amplification of the attack is so much stronger, i.e. Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Google itself for uh, authentication, right? Whether it's G Suite or whether it's personal Gmail and Google authentication. You pop it once, you get everything. You get literally everything related to that yeah. enterprise and each person within it. And so those are just very, very dangerous places. You know, they have to be done securely. And it's just hard to do. Yeah. Yep. All right, moving on. we got a few squirrel stories, and then we'll wrap this segment. Um, Two squirrels? I love it. Two squirrels. You know, the, the first one is, is just... Um, you know, I, evidence that I, I just need to do more more reading. Yeah, I barely know what a tardigrade <laughs> is. I know that they're well, you also know more called, than me. <laughs> they're also called water bears, I think, but they're the these tiny tiny organisms that get tested on a lot because they're so resilient. They can survive in space. They can survive at uh, zero degrees Kelvin. Uh, basically, they they go into some kind of uh, state where they can. You know, survive just about everything. And a tardigrade has been quantum entangled with a superconducting qubit. And I, I just, I don't understand any of that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, yeah, I have no clue what this stuff really means. I am just, the minute quantum is used in a sentence, I have to admit, I turn into a complete and total idiot. I know nothing about it. But conceptually, the idea of putting one of those little water bears because i love the term it looks like a water bear if you click on the link it's not wrong but putting one of those little water bears into a state of 
you know, Schrodinger's cat. I don't know if it, if I'm here or there or anywhere at any given moment. Just sounds like it'd be fun to see. I mean, you, so so one of the reasons I included this is I, I do think it's important in cybersecurity to be familiar with other research and, and things going on, everything from gadgets to uh, technology to to science. You know that this stuff eventually impacts us in in some way, and, and quantum has has been a kind of a nothing burger buzzword in cybersecurity <laughs> for a while. I think the only valid use case I've seen uh, for for anything quantum related has been like a random, you know, sor- source of entropy for encryption or something like that. Just, you know, like, like a, you know, if you need good uh, random number generation, uh, you can buy an appliance that has some kind of quantum stuff going on inside, you know, but, but then Cloudflare points a, a camera at a wall of, uh, uh, lava lamps and achieves the same the same goal so <laughs> and plus you know, the I, lava lamps look way way cooler let's be real they do and it's hilarious and it they have it somewhere where you can just like walk down the street and you can see it through the glass you know it's it's uh in some office location that is on a public street i'm in i think that's fantastic so um in the future on the show i, I would like to have I'd like to bring in some experts, you know, somebody come in, you know, I- explain, you know, what a superconducting qubit is, you know, some of this stuff. I, I think it'd be interesting to bring in some non-security uh, experts to to explain some of this stuff so we can better understand uh, maybe not how, you know, what happens to tardigrades, but uh, but how it, <laughs> it will eventually affect our industry. I agree totally. I would love to see that. See you. See us bring on some of those those uh, experts. But quite honestly, I do want to know what a tardigrade looks like when it's quantum entangled physically looks like. So that is a must answer. And in what can only be some kind of SEO grab, uh, Radio Shack returns as a crypto company. This is our other squirrel story. And by crypto, I mean cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, <laughs> that that the shortening of of Crypto, the shorthand crypto has been co-opted uh, for for cryptocurrency, sadly. Yeah, go ahead and cut back. You see my face? There you go. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it does tend to happen. You know, I think CompUSA, that brand was brought back as the face of some e-commerce thing. You know, I think Blockbuster's been brought back a few times for various things. It's, I, it's got to be brand recognition and SEO. I, I can't think of any other reason to use it. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I, I, I love tokens and crypto and DeFi. Like, I find it very interesting. It's, I understand way more about that than I do quantum. I'm definitely not a rock star at it, but I understand more about it than I do quantum. And this report says absolutely nothing other than we're bringing back the Radio Shack website to talk about low hanging fruit of DeFi and crypto literally tells us nothing other than they're coming back with a potentially radio token to do a money grab. So we'll see. So I think on the, uh, on the kind of funding investor side of things, it's interesting because this looks to be a, a PE or, or a VC shop retail e-commerce ventures that acquired this dead brand, uh, a year ago, something like that. And they probably uh, acquired it for next to nothing and found a way to make more money out of it. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I just think it's interesting this concept of uh, taking a, a well recognized but dead brand and combining it with new businesses instead of trying to create a brand and then promote that brand. But yeah. I think it's just, it's going to end in confusion. I, got, I think for, I'm going to find a way to, I think I'm going to find a way to resurrect uh, Jorts. Um, and the brand of jeans <laughs> shorts and use it as my own personal brand. Combine that with a uh, surge. <laughs> something, <laughs> something else from the nineties. Yes, sir. Give me some jorts and surge and I'll be running Zima. around forever. We'll be good to go. Zima. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's all we've got for this segment. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be right back to wrap up the year and, and talk about the year's most interesting interviews and stories that that we've done in the show. 